Hello everyone, it's time to enjoy our story, A Bear Called Paddington. And I'm going to read chapter 7 today, which is Adventure at the Seaside. I can't imagine what's going to happen to Paddington today. One morning, Mr Brown tapped the barometer in the hall. It looks as if it's going to be a nice day, he said. How about a trip to the sea? His m remark was greeted with enthusiasm by the rest of the family. And in no time at all, the house was in an uproar. Mrs Berg started to cut a huge pile of sandwiches while Mr Brown got the car ready. Jonathan and Judy searched for their bathing suits and Paddington went up to his room to pack. An outing which involved Paddington was always rather a business, as he insisted on taking all his things with him. As time went by, he had acquired lots of things. As well as his suitcase, he now had a smart weekend grip with the initials PB inscribed on the side and a paper carrier bag for the odds and ends. For the summer months, Mr Brown had bought him a sun hat. It was made of straw and very floppy. Paddington liked it. Before by turning the brim up and down, he could make it into different shapes. And it was really like having several hats in one. When we get to Brightsea, said Mrs Brown, Brown, we'll buy you a bucket and spade and then you can make a sand castle. And you can go to the pier, said Jonathan. They've got super machines on the pier. You get, you, you better bring plenty of coins. And we can go swimming, added Judy. You can swim, can't you? Mm, not very well, I'm afraid, replied Paddington. You see, I've never been to the seaside before. Never been to the seaside? Everyone stopped what they were doing and stared at Paddington. Never, said Paddington. They all agreed that it must be nice to be going to the seaside for the first time in one's life. Even Mrs Bird began talking about the time she first went to Brightsea many years before. Paddington became very excited as they told him all about the wonderful things he was going to see. The car was crowded when they started off and Mrs Bird, Judy and Jonathan sat in the back. Mr Brown drove and Mrs Brown and Paddington sat beside him. Paddington liked sitting in the front, especially when the window was open, so that he could poke his head out in the cool breeze. After a minor delay when Paddington's hat blew off on the outskirts of London, they were soon on the open road. Can you smell the sea yet, Paddington? asked Mrs Brown after a while. Paddington poked his head out and sniffed. I can smell something. Well, said Mr Brown, keep on sniffing because we're almost there. And sure enough, as they reached the top of a hill and rounded a corner to go down the other side, there it was in the distance, glistening in the morning sun. Paddington's eyes opened wide. Look at all the boats on the dirt, he cried, <coughs> pointing in the direction of the beach with his paw. Everyone laughed. That's not dirt, said Judy, that's sand. By the time they had explained all about sand to Paddington, they were in Brightsea itself and driving along the front. Paddington looked at the sea rather doubtfully. The waves were much bigger than he had imagined. Not so big as the ones he'd seen on his journey to England, but quite large enough for a small bear. Mr Brown stopped the car by a shop on the Esplanade and took out some money. I'd like to fit this bear out for a day at the sea, he said to the lady behind the counter. Now let's see. We shall need a bucket and a spade, a pair of sunglasses and one of those rubber tyres. As he reeled off the list, the lady handed the articles to Paddington, who began to wish he had more than two paws. He had a rubber tie around his middle which kept slipping down around his knees, a pair of sunglasses perched precariously on his nose, his straw hat, a bucket and spade in one hand and his suitcase in the other. Photograph, sir? Paddington turned to see an untidy man with a camera looking at him. Only one pound, sir. Results guaranteed. Money back if you're not satisfied. Paddington considered the matter for a moment. He didn't like the look of the man very much but he had been saving hard for several weeks and now had had just over three pounds. It would be nice to have a picture of himself. <clears throat> Won't take a minute, sir, said the man, disappearing around by a, behind a black cloth at the back of the camera. Just watch the birdie. Paddington looked round. There was no bird in sight, as far as he could see. He went around behind the man and tapped him. The photographer, who appeared to be looking for something, jumped and then emerged from under his cloth. How do you expect me to take your picture if you don't stand in the front? He asked. Now I w wasted a plate and, he looked shiftly at Paddington, that will cost you one pound. Paddington gave him a hard stare. You said there was a bird, he said, and there wasn't. I expect it flew away when it saw your face, said the man nastily. Now, where's my pound? Paddington looked at him even harder for a moment. Perhaps the bird took it when it flew away, he cried. Ha, ha, ha cried another photographer, who had been watching the proceedings with interest. Fancy you being taken in by a bear, Charlie. Serves you right for trying to take photographs without a licence. 
Now be off with you before I call a policeman. He watched while the other man gathered up his belongings and slouched off in the direction of the pier. Then he turned to Paddington. These people are a nuisance, he said, taking away the living from honest folk. You did quite right not to pay him any money. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to take a nice picture of you myself as a reward. The Brown family exchanged glances. I don't know, said Mrs Brown. Paddington always seems to fall on his feet. That's because he's a bear, said Mrs Bird. Bears always fall on their feet. She led the way onto the beach and carefully laid out a travelling rug on the sand behind a breakwater. This will be a good spot as any, she said. Then we should all know where to come back to and no one will get lost. The tide's out, said Mr Brown, so it will be nice and safe for bathing. He turned to Paddington. Are you going in, Paddington, he asked. Paddington looked at the sea. I might go for a paddle, he said. Well, hurry up, called Judy, and bring your bucket and spade. Then we can practice making sandcastles. Gosh, Jonathan pointed to a notice pinned on the wall behind them. Look, there's a sandcastle competition. Whizzo! First prize, ten pounds for the biggest sandcastle. Suppose we all join in and make one, said Judy. I bet the three of us together could make the biggest one you've ever seen. I don't think you're allowed to, said Mrs Brown, reading the notice. It says here everyone has to make their own. Judy looked disappointed. Well, I shall have a go anyway. Come on, you two, let's have a bathe first. Then we can start digging after lunch. She raced down the sand closely, followed by Jonathan and Paddington. At least Jonathan followed, but Paddington only got a few yards before his life belt slipped down and he went headlong in the sand. Paddington, do give me your suitcase, called Mrs Brown. You can't take it in the sea with you. It'll get wet and be ruined. Looking rather crestfallen, Paddington handed his things to Mrs Brown for safekeeping and then ran down the beach after the others. Judy and Jonathan were already a long way out when he got there, so he contented himself with sitting on the water's edge for a while, letting the waves swirl around him as they came in. It was a nice feeling, a bit cold at first, but he soon got warm. He decided the seaside was a nice place to be. He paddled out to where the water was deeper and then lay back in his rubber tyre, letting the waves carry him gently back to shore. Ten pounds! Supposing, su supposing he won ten whole pounds! He closed his eyes. In his mind, he had a picture of a beautiful castle made of sand, like the one he'd seen in a picture book, with battlements and towers and a moat. It was getting bigger and bigger, and everyone else on the beach had stopped to gather round and cheer. Several people said they had never seen such a big sand castle, and he woke with a start as he felt someone splashing water on him. Come on, Paddington, said Judy, L lying there in the sun, fast asleep. It's time for lunch, and we've got lots of work to do afterwards. Paddington felt disappointed. It had been a nice sand castle in his dream. He was sure it would have won first prize. He rubbed his eyes and followed Judy and Jonathan up to the beach, where Mrs Bird had laid out the sandwiches. Ham, egg and cheese for everyone, and marmalade for Paddington, with ice cream and fruit salad to follow. We'll have to find out whether Paddington makes a sandcastle tomorrow. Do you think he will? I think he might. I hope you enjoyed that one, and I will see you again tomorrow for our next instalment from Paddington. But until then, night-night and sleep well.